So with that, we can just invite the panel to come to the floor. So the panel will be chaired by direct, Deputy, the board, Deputy Director General, no more board members, Fiona Vanessa Paul. So please, and the panel come on stage. I will let them, Fiona, introduce them in a minute. But while they sit, you guys can answer this question. So that's going to be about instant payments, because this is the topic of the panel. So what is, in your view, your view here, needed to achieve full deployment and uptake of instant payments? All right, you have four, four options here at the bottom. <laughs> no, there's only four. No, we have, we are pre-selected. We are pre-selected here. Four, four, four options, four options. Thank you. So maybe I should read them here for you, Fiona, so you can see what they are, because it's quite small over here. The, so the lowest one, we're starting here over on the, on the left-hand side. Uh, instant payments regulation will solve the issue. So we have, that's over here. Then we have the majority saying, roll out our pan-European front-end solutions for end users. So that's majority saying that. Then we have uh, the two here competing at the end. We have solutions for corpor corporates to optimize their back-end processes. Okay, and the last one, this is competing with the other one, increase usage or offerings of public administrations. So this is the view of the audience. And now I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aline. And uh, good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here this morning and uh, to have the pleasure to, to moderate this uh, first panel where we look at uh, bringing instant to end users and the next steps to the, the full deployment of instant payments in line with the retail payment strategy that uh, Piero referred to in his speech. Um, I think everybody in this room and uh, most likely online is well aware that the instant payments regulation has entered into force on the 8th of April with the objective to ensure that all citizens and all businesses holding a payment account in EEA countries can make your denominated payments within a few seconds. Now, the level of adherence to the existing SEPA credit transfer instant payment scheme, however, seems to have plateaued a little bit over the last two years. And overall progress in deployment has been below expectations for far too long now. The full-scale benefits of instant payments for EU citizens, for businesses, and for public authorities cannot be fully achieved without complete reachability and availability, and this also at attractive conditions. In the area of person-to-person -person payments, instant payments are being used more regularly. This, I think, we all recognize and we see, and uh, often via payment solutions that were specifically designed for end users. But the current lack of choice of instant payment solutions, however, especially for payments to merchants and to other businesses, remains largely undressed, unaddressed, despite efforts to develop additional pan-European functionalities that support the usage of instant payments, such as SEPA requests to pay, for these use cases. And the use cases I have in mind here are the, the point of interaction, customer to business, and also person to professional. So in our panel today, we want to discuss which benefits stakeholders would expect from the regulation, what the expected uptake or deployment will be for end users, and what use cases are out there that could build on widely available instant payments. There are also some challenges to be dealt with on a technical and operational level when it comes to implementing the regulation, and we will touch a little bit on these as well. Um, so with that, let me start by introducing our esteemed panel. So I will start, uh, I have Marcel Hag, Director for Horizontal Policies in the Directorate General for Financial Stability at the European Commission. Next, I have Augustine Reyna, Director for Legal and Economic Affairs at Book, representing the consumer's perspective. Uh, besides uh, Augustine, we have Sandra Poita, Senior Product Manager at ABN AMRO. Next, we have Fernando Rodrigo Ferrer, Head of Business Development at Bizum, a provider of a widely used instant payment solution in Spain. And last but by no means least, uh, Axel Schaefer, Advisor of Payments at the Inca Group Treasury, maybe better known to all of us as IKEA, providing the perspective of the merchants. Yes. So, we have set up the panel according to two themes, and uh, we also want to have the, the chance at the end, if possible, to, to give you in the audience uh, the possibility to raise some questions to the panelists. 
But the, the first topic that we want to look at are the immediate impacts and benefits from the regulation. And uh, perhaps who better to uh, enlighten us and uh, share a uh, perspective on this is, is Marcel. So could you explain perhaps, Marcel, the, the key provisions and the deadlines of the regulation and how the Commission is planning to support stakeholders when it comes to implementation? Yeah, happy to. Uh, happy to do that, Fiona. Um, you mentioned the key provision already of the instant payment uh, regulation, and that's the obligation to offer uh, for uh, the obligation on PS, uh, PS, uh, PS to offer regular transfers. Um, who are offering regular transfers um, to offer instant instant payments? Um, and this is complemented, this obligation to introduce instant payments uh, on, uh, on PSPs is complemented by the obligation to offer, uh, to offer instant payment as at, at a charge or a fee that is not higher than uh, the fee charged for regular uh, credit transfers. These two obligations together uh, will ensure that instant payments will become the new normal uh, in uh, when it comes to um, uh, euro uh, credit credit transfers. So that's the that's the core. But then there are uh, a few other key provisions. Uh, one is the um, the Iban name. Uh, uh, verification, which um, is uh, a means to prevent, first of all, fraud, but then also to avoid mis, um, uh, misdirected um, um, uh, trans transfers um, caused by an error made made by the uh, by the um, payer. Um, then there is a provision that supports the acceleration of um, uh, of, uh, of the credit transfer, um, and that is the sanction screening, where we will move from a system of transaction by transaction uh, verification to um, an obligation uh, on uh, PSPs to um, verify whether their customers are um, listed on an EU uh, sanctions list uh, on a daily basis. So every day, PSPs have to check whether their customers are listed, are listed or not. And obviously, um, every time a new sanctions list is being published, this verification has to be uh, done immediately. And then uh, finally, I should also mention that um, we use this occasion to, um, to ensure that non-banking PSPs um, can have, so um, essentially, essentially um, PIs and, and, and EMIs can have access to payment system, which was not, was not the case before. Now, when it comes to the implementation dates, there are many. <laughs> um, and we um, have a basic distinction between um, uh, first of all, the, um, um, the obligation to ensure that um, customers can receive um, the instant payments uh, and um, an obligation uh, on uh, ensuring that customers are able to send uh, instant, instant payments. That's one distinction. And then we have a distinction between euro area PSPs and non-euro area PSPs. Now, PSPs um, uh, to introduce uh, the reception of, um, uh, of uh, direct payments. The deadline is very soon. It's the 9th of January of next year. Um, the, um, uh, and then on the 9th of January, by the 9th of, January, uh, by the 9th of October of next year, um, PSPs have to ensure that their clients can make uh, can also make instant payments, and that is for the intra for for PSPs inside the European uh, inside the euro area. Um, now, for PSPs outside the euro area, they are being given a bit more time. They have until um, the um, they have until twenty twenty seven to introduce uh, to introduce um, uh, instant payment reception and sending uh, for their 
for their customers. So um, overall, um, um, the introduction of, um, of, of instant payment is around the corner for those who have not, uh, for, for those PSPs that are not offering it yet. Thank you very much. And maybe that's a, a nice lead into Sandro, who representing a, a major euro area uh, bank, a major PSP. Where do you see the, the main impacts of the regulation for a bank, both in terms of the, the challenges and also maybe the benefits and the opportunities, uh, maybe in terms of offering uh, new payment channels? And uh, also perhaps uh, another aspect to look at is uh, liquidity management and, and treasury, because I think this is an important aspect for banks. Sandro. Yes. Well, first of all, let me um, inform you that ABN Emmer was one of the banks uh, who, uh, who was offering instant payments right from the start in November 2017. Mm -hmm. So um, we uh, really adopted this new development and um, we also had the vision to really um, offer all our customers the opportunity to use instant payments. And in order to do so, we said, OK, there is no difference between a SEPA credit transfer and an instant credit transfer. That's rather a technical difference. But for our customers, they just want to transfer money and they want us to do it as quickly as we can. Uh, we already did that uh, raised, uh, years before for all the transactions between two ABN Emerald accounts. So our customers were used to that fact. And then when this opportunity uh, came along, to also offer this for transactions to other banks, we really embrace this. And then uh, with this new regulation now coming up, we mainly see the benefits because the reach for our customers will really increase. So through, through European reach, and that's really important. We also very much welcome the verification of payee solution. Uh, we had a similar solution or we have a similar solution already in the Netherlands. And what I can tell is that our customers do really value the reassurance. So it's not simply saying there's no match, but the fact that there is a match and showing it to them. And we do that by visualizing it. So we, 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 we show a green check mark in your screen whenever the IBAN and the name belongs together. And it's very reassuring to, to customers because they know whenever we make that transfer to an organization we never paid before, we know it's a, it's a good transaction. There will be no risks. So this really uh, will help uh, our users. And then one of the other benefits that we see is that um, the foundation is, will now be there to offer a true um, online payment met method. ABN Emerald just joined the EPI initiative uh, last year. So the ideal transactions within the Netherlands will migrate to the EPI solution. So being a more European one, uh, we really embrace these this European um, opportunities. Of course, we see some challenges as well, uh, let's be honest. Um, there, the fact that we have to process batch payments or bulk payments or whatever we call them as, as instant payments, we welcome it. But what we do foresee is challenges for the real large batches. The small ones are easy to process. We don't see any issues there. But the larger ones, these are the challenges. So we are already discussing with our partners, the clearing and settlement uh, organizations, to see how can we avoid congestions. Because when we process in some payments, we normally have agreements on how many transactions per second we can process, the clearing can process. But let's not forget the recipient's bank. Because the recipient's bank really has to respond and say, yes, I can process this transaction or I have to reject it. But if they cannot answer within the given timeline, then we will face a lot of rejections. So having that balance of transactions per second on the sending side, but also on the receiving side, and then maybe someone in the middle who can manage a little bit all of that traffic, well, that's really important to avoid uh, congestion. So those challenges we will have to face together and hopefully we will find a solution there. And then finally, coming back to the liquidity management aspect, um, yes, it is a challenge. Uh, luckily, uh, based on the experience that we have today, our liquidity managers are now used to how to do so. Uh, we are really happy with the changes a few years back uh, that we can now fund the clearing and settlement technical accounts from the TIPS uh, DCA on a 24-7 basis. It's really important to have that 
uh, to make sure that we can automate the funding and the defunding to make sure there will always be funds available. And let's not forget also our regular subaquatic transfers are already in a pre-funded system. So we have experience to do so. So moving just more subaquatic transfers to instant for us will not be that much of a challenge, but I can imagine when you have to start right now, when you did not yet offer instant payments, you will have to face these challenges altogether. So yes, I do understand that some PSPs, uh, yeah, really fear this regulation. But they can benefit perhaps from the institution sure. have yeah. made in the in the last couple of years. Thank you. And maybe, uh, Fernando, you are a, a, success, a successful provider of a P2P solution based on a SCT Instant in Spain. In which aspects do you expect to benefit from the regulation? Thank you, Fiona. Thank you for having me. Well, I think in the end, um, um, legislation is key for alternative payment methods like P2P, in particular for account account based solutions, right? So um, I would like to break down in three chapters. Uh, we already covered some of those from the Instant Payment Legislation, and then I would like to talk about the PSR and PSD3, and in the last part about digital euro. But before that, I'd like to give a little context, right? Because in the end, as you said, it's a very popular P2P uh, solution in Spain, but not only uh, as P2P, right? Where back in 2016, when the Spanish financial ecosystem decided to do it together in order to build a, a solution on top of the SEPA instant scheme, they decided that they they would need to work together in order to offer a sustainable business model on some capabilities that the pan-european that the that the eurozone was going to to develop right so in that regards uh, today bitum is not only a p2p solution we we have more than 26 million users and 70,000 online merchants that are already part of, of bitum and the use cases that we offer today fully based on instant payments are p2p e-commerce donations to ngos corporate payouts payment to professionals and consumer, consumer QR presented at the point of sale. Right now, we are working on an NMC capabilities and also on some digital identity capabilities, not directly linked to the payment, but we think we can offer some to the to the consumers that are willing to not uh, have any password in their mind and then using the phone number as a key identifier on the on the internet, right? So in this regards, I think um, uh, what we did in Bithum from the very beginning today is a novelty, right? So there is no solutions in Europe offering instant payments for all the use cases that they have so far. So I think we have paved the way for many others that will come afterwards, and uh, we can benefit from the less students that we are achieving. So um, uh, coming back to the three chapters that I mentioned, first of all, in the instant payments legislation, we understand that the verification of the view. That's better, better now. So we think that no, yes, yes. Thank you. Oh, really? Oh, sorry, I didn't realize. So regarding, uh, sorry, so regarding the first point, the instant payments legislation. I think on the on the first item, the verification of pay. Um, I think in the end it's key so consumers realize we are paying too. So in this sense, we are happy that uh, legislation um, was in favor of uh, accepting other type of verifications, not only the consumer typing the the pay the name of the payee. So we already got a prevalidation of in this regard. So consumers are well aware of who are paying to either it's a consumer or a merchant. So that's really good news. Regarding the uptake of instant payments, I understand that all the PSPs that are offering railroad transfers should offer also instant payments at some point. So they can also benefit from the restaurant line we have have uh, achieved in business. So we already have this cross-border experience with Andorra. Andorra is a very, very small market in the north of Spain, but the Andorran banks are also part of Bithum today. So it's a, a, a cross-border situation where we have Andorran uh, accounts and Spanish accounts um, uh, along with Bithum. And the third part regarding distant payments legislation, uh, it was already mentioned, the, san the sanction screening. So, we are in favor that we can share uh, information with all the PSPs that are part of the solution. So we are also enabling some kind of solutions that uh, help PSPs to identify potential fraudster because in the end we already know if they already gone through different banks and they've performed a um, nasty situation where uh, we realize that we have some uh, requests for information from the political authorities. Regarding the second part of the PSD3 uh, and PSR, 
we understand that we are stretching the capabilities of instant payments scheme. So um, uh, we, still we need a lot to work into this kind of solutions so we can build full-fledged uh, payment retail solutions. So we are working also in providing some uh, aspects, in the, some contributions in these regards. So we understand that by definition, a credit transfer cannot be initiated by a pay. So this this um, uh, give us a position that is not competitive against other payment methods, right? So um, a, a beneficiary cannot propose an exemption, for example, right, with an instant payments uh, solution. And also regarding the fraud levels, why the fraud levels are much higher, or much more demanding on an account token solution than a card solution? Why? So we all these kind of things we need to be aware of that. Be, uh, before trying to be competitive with other with other solutions, or so for example, pre-authorization, right? So you cannot perform a pre-authorization with an account account-based solutions, right? And the third part, uh, the digital euro. I understand that um, in the end, uh, in both of our part, the same distributors that will be part of the digital euro, right? So all the same supervised intermediaries will have to distribute the digital euro um, eventually, right? So why not um, the legislation could be aligned? with all these um, uh, situations where PSPs that are offering already an instant payment solutions like Bithum could also benefit from the existing uh, successful solution and the, the adoption of successful solutions like Bithum in order to integrate also potentially the digital euro, right? So that will benefit the existing ecosystem, that will benefit uh, reducing existing capabilities that not only PSPs, but also merchants and consumers are really aware of and that could benefit, right? And, and I think uh, Piero Cipollon before mentioned the interoperability um, um, project that we are undertaking with Portugal and, and Italy. So uh, that also could benefit the digital euro. So once it's live, we can benefit from the lessons learned that we have in this pan-European reach because we understand the pan-European reach is still missing, right? So we can benefit from this, from this, from this experience when the digital euro is a reality. Some of these aspects will be taken up in the in the next panel indeed as well. Um, Augustine, we've heard from the, the legislator, from the, the providing side of uh, what can be done to benefit the consumers, but be interested uh, from your perspective, because you were, of course, very much in, in contact with the consumers. What do the consumers uh, see as being most beneficial? And are there also points of concern or maybe even some disadvantages for them? Super. Thank you very much and good morning, uh, everyone. Um, perhaps before taking a, a step back and thinking where instant payment sits in the payment landscape. And, and from the consumer perspective, it's something that we also um, make clear throughout the, the negotiations of this, of this regulation, is that this is another effort to bring more choices to consumers in terms of uh, payment, payment options. But as I said, this is one of the, of the options, but if we look at how much have been achieved in terms of payment in the payment landscape for consumers in the last uh, decades and it was mentioned that the, the first conference was in 99 um, it is pretty good actually and i think something that we have to be um, we have to be uh, proud of comparatively consumers uh, in europe are much better off than the consumers in, in somewhere else in the uh, in, in in the world and i think it's important to acknowledge this especially in times of uh, european uh, elections because all these progress will not have been achieved if it's not because of the uh, of the eu you no know, ranging from the cost of um, car based payments to uh, strong customer authentication instant payments now so on uh, so on so on so forth so this um additional options that, that consumers uh, will have help on one side to enable credit transfer without uh, relying on uh, other, other schemes, which is uh, important also from the point of view of uh, cutting down uh, dependencies, but also because it introduced more competition. And at the end, that can uh, will benefit, uh, benefit consumers and it can help to decrease, to decrease, uh, decrease costs. In terms of very practical applications, you know, it was mentioned before, proximity low um, payments, peer-to-peer uh, -peer transaction, uh, and payments at the point of sale, you know, which certainly it's a, it's a new possibility that uh, the consumers um, will, uh, will have. The additional measures 
also to prevent uh, cases of fraud or, or mistake, you know, I, um, IBAN um, verification has proven to be very effective in the countries where it exists, like for example, in the, in the, in the Netherlands. And, and having this uh, across Europe will certainly uh, benefit uh, consumers. Um, of course, there are points of, of attention to, to consider uh, because we are talking again about uh, a digital means of payment. Uh, and we know uh, that uh, many consumers across um, Europe uh, have difficulties to engage with digital means of payment. So, for example, our Norwegian member um, did a survey a um, couple of, uh, of years ago uh, in Norway, a very digitalized country, we imagine, and a significant part of consumers you know, have difficulties to make uh, electronic uh, payments. So this is something that we, we need to, to consider also uh, regarding the rollout of the Digital uh, Euro project. You know, digitalization is here to stay and we need to make the best out of it for everybody. You know? um, making sure that you know, means of payment remain uh, accessible and, uh, and inclusive for, uh, for all consumers. Um, when it comes to, to the risk, uh, something that we also need, uh, need to consider is that when instant payment, you know, money flows very quickly. And it also means that there could be uh, mistakes, there could be new opportunities for, um, uh, for fraud. You know? There are people out there trying to get hold of consumers' <laughs> money, uh, and certainly this is uh, an opportunity that they might see to, uh, to increase their uh, criminal activities. Um, and we need, therefore, to be, to be mindful of that, uh, of that situation uh, uh, as well. Uh, and then finally, um, something that we need to acknowledge is that choice is obviously good, but the levels of protection that consumers face in all these different um, uh, options regarding means of payment, it's different. And consumers also need to be aware of that. And this is something that um, special attention needs to, be, uh, needs, to be, needs to be paid so consumers know about the advantages and disadvantages of paying with one or another means of payment. Okay, so still a little bit more to be done on the, the side of uh, consumer education in, indeed, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Axel, we, we all know IKEA for their, their physical stores and it is very literally a, a household name, but let me ask you about instant payments in your role as a, as a large corporate. What about your, your back-end processes and uh, also liquidity management for an entity such as yourselves? How are you looking to integrate instant payments? Thank you, Fiona, and uh, thanks for having me. Good morning, everyone. Um, in my day-to-day -day role, I typically focus more on the front end. But fortunately, I'm part of the treasury organization uh, within Inca, so I also have a, a few insights on how the back-end processes look like, and I'm, I'm happy to share that with you. Um, I suppose just like with any other corporate treasury unit, um, we um, are running the bank and cash uh, management activities on behalf of all entities that are part of the Inca group. Um, and with that comes, of course, the implementation of a comprehensive treasury management system that also allows us to initiate payments on behalf of entities that are part of the, uh, part of the group. Um, now, when we look at these backend processes that are impacted by the introduction of instant payments, I think it's important to look at this twofold. There will be impacts when we look at incoming payments that are hitting our bank accounts, but certainly there will also be impacts when we perform payments on behalf of these entities when, you know, we see money leaving our accounts. Um, I think, let me, let me start with the inbound payments. Um, of course, also more my, my speciality. Um, if we consider that instant bank payment methods um, take over a portion of what we currently see as, you know, conventional batch-based uh, retail payments, there's likely going to be an impact on, um, on the way we process payments um, on, on the back-end system. We will see numerous individual lines in our bank statements, and there is a likelihood that that may cause you know, performance-related issues to our systems. Um, so the way we operate today is very likely not going to be possible tomorrow when we see a massive influx of instant-based payments hitting our bank account. Um, there are, of course, ways to make sure that we alter those capacities to make sure that we are able to, to process them. But there's also just simple solutions by way of, you know, opening dedicated accounts upon which we then receive those instant-based payments. We then perform perhaps fewer checks than we would ordinarily do for other inbound payments um, because today we run about 15 to 20 different checks per inbound transactions. 
I suppose those checks will no longer be needed if we can control those inbound instant retail payments. Um, so I think, I think we can somehow limit that impact on performance um, by maneuvering around, um, around these different um, you know, alternatives. Um, but I suppose for, for merchants with perhaps less elaborate systems, they may indeed face some challenges, especially those that perhaps don't run those comprehensive, um, you know, treasury management systems. Um, I see one specific advantage in the uptake of instant payments for the backend processes of inbound payments, specifically because you can ultimately combine your sales and bank reconciliation processes. Um, of course, that can only be provided if indeed the merchant is in full control of the messaging that, uh, that will also appear on the bank statement, right? So I will have an example, if one of you um, goes and shops at Ikea, which I think would, would be great, uh, you, you present your mobile phone, uh, you initiate that instant payment um, transaction, what happens is that every transaction, of course, in our sales system is recorded, it comes with a specific ID. That ID should then be transmitted via the mobile phone to the backend processes and then should ultimately appear also on our bank statement so that we see the exact same ID within our sales system and within our bank statement. And that we can simply match and can basically eliminate all the in-between. Today, it's, it's much more complicated. Um, so that's on the, on, the inbound, um, on the inbound side. When we talk about the outgoing payments, Within the unit that I'm working with, we, we, we face quite a lot of those activities. There we differentiate, differentiate between financial and commercial payments. I suppose financial payments for now we can leave out. They will very likely not be within the framework of instant payments because the, the sheer uh, you know, uh, value of those transactions uh, is probably exceeding any limit. Uh, but when we talk about commercial payments, payments to suppliers, payments to payload, perhaps in certain instances, even refund payments to our customers, they will surely fall within the remit of, 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 of this uh, regulation. Um, and I think it's important here to, to note that there are also a few impacts that, um, that may be performance linked. And here I would like to also pick up on the, on the, the, the point that uh, Sandra mentioned on batch-based payments. When we receive, on behalf of the different entities, requests to initiate payments, very often we receive them um, based on batch payments. Uh, and I think this is a, a very efficient way of working um, for, for corporates. Uh, and of course, I would advocate for this kind of way of working to also be compatible in the, in the new functioning of, of payments. Uh, so if there is a way for us to keep on working with batch processing with an instant, that would be, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, another impact, of course, from a process point of view is that we will no longer be bound to the clear cutoff times that we have today. There's more flexibility when it comes to, you know, authorizing payments. Uh, you may no longer have to do that before a certain time, but if you do that on a Friday night when, when you come home, I think that should also be fine. Uh, so there's a bit more flexibility uh, when it comes to those processes. And then lastly, also around costs. Today we receive on a quite frequent um, um, nature requests from entities to perform payments on an urgent um, on an urgent nature. Of course, uh, we can do that, uh, but our partner banks, they will request for an additional premium, which is very often also quite hefty. When we now look in the future where ordinary payments will be on par with instant payments, very likely that premium will no longer exist because all SEPA payments will be instant, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think it will also be a potential for us to bring on costs by working more efficiently. Thank you. And I think a number of the points uh, you mentioned there uh, can be uh, interesting for uh, people in our audience today, and uh, we may pick up on these in the, the Q&A later. Um, we move to the, the second theme we wanted to explore, the evolution of instant payments in the longer run, where we move to a world where we really see that we have a, a full deployment of uh, instant payments. And uh, perhaps, Marcel, I, I start with you. The, the regulation, it's not prescriptive on instant payments used at the, the point of sale or point of interaction. And uh, this is the segment which could benefit uh, from, from market initiatives. How do you see the developments of instant payments here and uh, the role that the Commission could play in this respect? So let me, let me first say that it's not our role to prescribe, to prescribe mm. 
concrete solutions, concrete solutions here. That is really up to, for the industry to develop. Um, we, um, uh, our objective is to incentivize new innovative solutions, but then it's really, it's really, uh, and, and create a framework for that. And then it's really up to the industry to, to use this. But, um, but that said, um, we see, um, a lot of potential for the use of um, uh, of instant payments uh, uh, at um, at the um, uh, at POI. We see that uh, um, instant payments could be a valuable alternative to to cards here, um, and um, uh, the regulation will will facilitate uh, the acceptance of. Um, uh, of instant payments by merchants, both in shops and 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 in e-commerce, um, um, the costs of um, of accepting uh, IP at at POI should also be uh, very competitive. Um, so we think that there is a lot of potential there, but of course, um, in shops you need uh, you need the initiation uh, either through a QR code or um, or NFC, so that is something that um, that uh, needs to be worked on. We are uh, at the Commission doing our best to to make sure that um, that the uh, uh, that the NFC antenna will be um, will will operate in a in a in an open and competitive environment. Um, um, and we are using um, the instruments that we have at our disposal. Uh, to make sure that that's the case, um, and uh, we're very supportive of the um, of the efforts to um, uh, to um, standardize um, a QR code and develop um, uh, standards here. Um, um, the ERPB and uh, and uh, the EPC are uh, are working on this, and um, and uh, we think that that all of this. Um, goes in in the right direction but as i said we can make sure that there is a frame that there is a a, a frame a conducive framework but uh, but then it's really up uh, to um, to the innovators to uh, to make the best possible use of it indeed no standardization i think is absolutely key especially if we want to move indeed. towards uh, pan-european solutions uh, Sandra, from the, the bank perspective, in which market segments, be it corporates, consumers, uh, do you expect to, uh, to have growth in the demand of instant payments once the, once the regulation is fully applied? Okay, yeah, let me first uh, give an example of another um, way of communicating. You know, back in the days, we only had postal cards to send a message to each other. Then a few years ago, we started with text messages, and nowadays we use WhatsApp or other similar message systems, which in really give more value to the customers. And customers still have a choice which one to use, but we see that the majority tends to use the WhatsApp and the equivalent message services that are out there because of it's immediately there and you can actually see whether the recipient read your message. The same is true for credit transfers, you know, you can use the old one that we still have, but we are one of the banks, or many of the banks in the Netherlands use instant payments as the default. Like I explained, there is no choice. So what you see then is that the majority tends to move to the transaction type, which offers the most value. So we already see today um, for both consumers and corporates using our internet banking systems where they can actually manually initiate the, the transaction, more than 95% of all those transactions are already instant. So we already see the tendency to move there. So what we will see in the future is what I explained, those batch payments. Um, yes, we still intend to offer the batch processes, uh, Axel, but we also offer APIs. So if a corporate would like to connect through an API from their system to initiate the, the transaction with us, and then we could also give the report back through a similar API, you know, that would be on a real time 24 seven basis. That's the customer's choice. So we will have these different channels and also coming back to the, to the consumers and not everyone being able to, uh, to, to use all these digital means. Uh, we still have the option to use a 
paper-based instruction. And of course, it takes time for that instruction to reach the bank, let's be honest, but once it gets there, yeah, no problem to process it at an instant payment. So we will offer these same opportunities to all types of customers through all types of, of channels. Um, and uh, and we, we think really in a few years' time, 95% of all transactions will be instant. Of course, there's still a choice, there's still something to use in a, in a different way if really needed, uh, but I think the majority will move there. Um, the challenges that we will see is within these point of interaction domain, because although we will work with Epi on, uh, on a new solution to offer those kind of transactions also at the point of interaction, we still face the challenges, the, the screening requirements, although it, it will be improved, we still face some issues over there that will, at this point in time, really uh, hamper the take up, but we hope that we can work on that and, and make it happen, make sure that we can, uh, it can be, that we can use it there as well. Thank you for that, Sandra. And it's, you know, I have to say, I also myself, I believe we've come a long way in Europe. It was mentioned uh, by Ulrich and by Piero earlier with uh, the SEPA transfers that we know today. So I think we are getting there with the instant and we move to a world where we see it more and more by default. We are using instant. And maybe, um, Axel, going back to you, because uh, from the, the merchant's perspective, and you have both the online and the physical stores, um, what are your expectations regarding the, the future uh, when it comes to instant payments in both of these? Uh, channels. Um, yes, that's a very good question. I think. I think first of all, I'd like to, um, you know, also resonate what Mr. Cipollone mentioned in his keynote speech earlier. That indeed, specifically in the cross-border retail payment environment, we also observe a severe lack of competition, which is why we welcome this initiative to begin with, because it has the potential to ultimately bring new entrants in that space. Um, EPI is one of those uh, players, but the entire open banking framework will help to achieve the same if you know um, implemented correctly, and ultimately also the Digital Europe project has that has that objective. So we welcome all these object uh, all these initiatives, mm -hmm. with the uh, with the aim of you know bringing more competition, more choice to the consumers, and ideally also bring down costs for us. Um, how can they be ultimately implemented in the front end solution of a merchant? Um, that's going to be a bit more tricky. Uh, I think here it's, although we can see nowadays the, the, the lines between offline and online blurring more and more, I think there is still a need to differentiate it when we talk about implementing these solutions, uh, simply because customers behave differently when they are in a merchant's physical premises or whether they sit in front of their desktop and you know want to shop something online. For that reason, um, we estimate that introducing instant payments within an e-commerce environment should be somewhat more efficient than it is um, in store. Why? Because already today in a number of different European countries, paying by invoice is one of the most prominent, most uh, beloved ways of checking out. You, ship, uh, you, you purchase your good, good is shipped to you, then you pay. Um, and how do how do customers pay? They say they pay with SCT, right, with an ordinary credit transfer. So, as a matter of fact, for the merchant, there isn't anything to change. Um, so that, that that is one simple reason. Uh, another reason is that our customers typically uh, are more patient when they shop online, right? So we can ask um, for the entire checkout checkout process to take a few seconds longer than that process would take at the physical store. Um, Another point that I think why um, instant payment uptake at e-commerce is at least at the start a bit easier is because we can also see multiple alternatives of, um, of that novel way to, to be introduced also via open banking solutions. Mm. Uh, they can be somewhat easier integrated. You don't need necessarily um, have to have a comprehensive end-to-end -end system in place that governs the transaction from the payer to the payee. Open banking may do the trick here as well. Um, but of course, um, if you want to control the entire um, flow, then indeed a, a comprehensive solution may, may be the um, best alternative, but that may come with uh, you know, more um, you know, resource uh, intensive uh, implementation. In terms of the physical point of sale, obviously a bit more um, 
a bit more challenging. First of all, because, um, and I think this is also referring to, to what you said, um, how does a payment behave when it's carried out at the physical premises, but it's not a card-based payment? Is it classified from a regulatory point of view as a remote or a proximity payment? Whether it's the one or the other, there will be different implications, also in terms of processing and lenience, uh, so uh, the, the, the latency. Um, and latency is indeed a critical aspect for the physical point of sale, specifically in the high volume checkout. Um, think of, uh, for example, you know, public transport. You simply cannot afford yourself to wait 20 seconds for a payment to be processed. It needs to go super quick. Um, so for that reason, uh, it's, it's very critical that, that the transaction timing is indeed as quickly as possible. Uh, for that same reason, I would estimate, at least right now, perhaps point of sale payments based on an open banking environment may not be the best fit, um, but I'm, I'm happy to be proven wrongly. Um, but I would estimate that a, indeed a, a comprehensive end-to-end, -end, you know, scheme system that um, you know governs the entire flow from payer to payee will be the best alternative. But of course, we have uh, also heard from 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 Mr. Cipollone earlier. Currently, these solutions are only deployed domestically. We are looking forward to seeing these solutions crossing borders, to seeing solutions being deployed on numerous uh, EU countries for us. That's crucial because we operate in almost 20 EU countries. So um, we would really welcome a, you know, a, an EU-wide solution available to, to make this happening. Uh, nonetheless, of course, integrating um, such solution at the point of sale will be more challenging, not only because you have to, um, have to you know, it will impact the, the hardware at some point, uh, but we need to secure that those processes rely on open and interoperable standards. Mm -hmm. um, and that is also why we participate actively to the, to the standardization of the, those QR codes, because ultimately that's, that's where we can really facilitate that more easy integration at the end of the day. Absolutely. The ease of use is, is key here. I see Eileen uh, standing in front of me. We started a little bit with, with some delay, so I'm assuming we can steal a little bit, a few minutes into the coffee break. Can we go until 11? Is that possible? Yeah, okay, because I still wanted to, to reach out to Fernando as a provider of solutions, and we talked to or Axel referred to the, the need for solutions uh, uh, going forward. Uh, what do you think, um, Fernando, when it comes to instant payments, what do you think is needed in order to conquer the POS domain? Well, I, I think we need to structure the, the, the answer in two levels, right? On the first one, uh, in our case, for example, we are considered a, a payment arrangement according to, to the PISA framework. So in the end, what we do is we provide all the framework, all the rules, all the guidelines, all the operational uh, and the functional um, uh, guidelines that PSPs need to implement in order to uh, include PISA as a payment method for, for into their channels, right? So in this, in this case, we have this secondary layer, but in the end, the PSPs need before to comply with a primary layer, which is the adherence to SEPA inch. So all the PSPs need to comply with, with need to be part of the SEPA scheme, of the instant SEPA scheme, before uh, having b as a payment method, right? So uh, in the end, we have these uh, arrangements that we built on top of the SEPA scheme, but in the end, we need to comply with all the SEPA schemes. So in the end, we have different elements from the uh, schemes that still need to be solved. Uh, Axel just mentioned the, the latency, the time response. Uh, at the point of sale, we cannot wait 20 seconds for consumers to pay, a supermarket or transport, as, as he mentioned. Also, there are any other elements, right? So like, for example, uh, enabling uh, technical cancellation at the point of sale. So maybe the, the, the operation doesn't go through, so it got cancelled before the payment, the settle, it's settled. So these kind of things, which are pretty much solved on the car business, still need to be solved uh, on account-to-account -account, uh, solutions. And indeed, we have provided some uh, change requests to the EPC, and also uh, we, are, uh, we welcome the, the legislation that will uh, enable us to, to um, enable some kind of uh, op uh, complex operations that today are not allowed under, under account-to-account -account solutions, right? So, but this will solve the standardization part, right? But still, uh, as, as you mentioned, the, also the private sector should, be, should take care of that. And in that regard, I think the, the brand and the user experience are key. Uh, once that provides confidence to the consumer that they're using something that they rely, that they have seen in many other environments. 
and the more use cases you offer, it's easier that consumers will think of you as a, a, the primary choice when they are trying to pay. Also, the sustainable business model. Uh, if you have a sustainable business model, PSPs and merchants and consumers uh, will, be, will prefer your option. Otherwise, it's really hard that uh, anyone is going to push your solution if you don't have a sustainable business model. And the third part is the rules and, and procedures. That will cover the secondary layer that I mentioned earlier, right? We provide everything regarding disputes, um, refunds, chargebacks, everything that is still needs to be uh, taken care of. It's not the most appealing part of the payment itself, but you need to take care into, you, know, you have to take this into account because otherwise merchants are not going to uh, prefer your choice, your solution, if you don't have all these procedures in place in the, uh, beforehand, right? So, uh, but before getting there, once you build P, P2P e-commerce, those are digital solutions, but when it comes to the point of sale, uh, there is a missing uh, piece that is the hardware. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the first place, you need all the terminals that are distributed around Europe. You need to be adopted in, adopted in, in before uh, having the chance to your solution to be accepted. And that's where the, the dilemma between uh, QR and, NF and NFC, as Marcel was mentioning, uh, comes into place, right? I think in, in, in our case, where we've led others to uh, start their race 10 years uh, in advance, right? So there are many big techs that are willing, that are already uh, convincing the consumers to use NFC on their wallets before any other options. And that's something that we've allowed to, that to happen. And hopefully, I'm glad to see it also that uh, Piero Cipollone letters to the commission, what Marcel was mentioning, that uh, right now we're in a position, we're in a shifting point that hopefully we can, uh, uh, we can convince or, or uh, enable some kind of capabilities that today are not uh, uh, feasible in some kind of terminals, right? So hopefully we can have the same access to the secure element, to the antenna. So solutions like uh, Bithum in our case, or in the future Epi, MBWay, Bancomat, can offer at the point of sale these kind of solutions. So hopefully we'll see that in the upcoming years. But as I mentioned, once we cover all the standardization and the part of the private sector that will deal, will deal, will need to deal with it, and then it comes the hardware part. Uh, eventually, we think that once these uh, commitments by Apple are are assumed, and there we still see uh, solutions that are doable, that are capable of offering this type of uh, solutions, we'll see that we will have a more competitive uh, landscape at the point of sale, and we will see instant payments uh, live at the point of sale. Uh, sooner than, than okay thank you and i appreciate the conviction that you, you express with this uh fernando this is important thank you uh, we still have uh, just a few minutes i wanted to go back augustine because you referred to fraud uh in the in the previous uh, round and i just wanted to to ask you uh what you think are needed what are the actions you would consider needed to combat fraud because this is a very important uh topic too yes thank, thank you and um, very briefly also picking up on something that you said uh, at the end of my, my, my initial remarks, is that consumers need to be, need to be informed, of course. Mm. Consumer awareness is important, but we're talking about complex markets. We're talking about um, situations in which, you know, simply consumers do not know how things work behind a screen. <laughs> and, and, and therefore, we need what we call default protections. How these default protections are going to be implemented, is not something for, for me to say or for myself to say, but is for the industry to implement it. What the legislation does creates the incentives or indicates, you know, what those default protections will be. Um, uh, stroke customer authentication, uh, for example. Now we have uh, IBAN name checks, um, but then it's for, for the industry to, to implement it. And, and one of the, um, the, the points that was um, uh, highlighted in the initial survey is convenience. Of course, we need to make this convenient. We need to make convenience for consumers to pay, but also we need to make convenience consumers to be well protected. Um, and on, 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 on that note, I think I already mentioned the pay verification, but thinking about spending limits as well. This is a way to protect consumers at the end of the day. We believe and consider that the, payment, uh, um, the spending limits should be set rather on the lower uh, end and then consumers can, can change it. Mm -hmm. That's of course should be a, a possibility which can be made very easily in the technical solutions, but the default should be um, more on the on, on the conscious side. Um, and then calling off periods, for example, um, to change these spending limits. You know, sometimes consumers can be under pressure, you know, if um, uh, um, a froster 
you know, is trying to get a, a quick payment. So a possibility could be as well that when you increase the spending limits, you know, um, in, a, in a considerable extent, that there is a need for, for a cooling off uh, period until this become effective. So that could be also a way to, to protect consumers that might be manipulated in the, to make, a, uh, to make a, a payment. And then just a very uh, final point of what you, what you have, uh, have said. Indeed, the, the technology is there, you know, um, being through the QR codes or the NFC uh, antennas. And this is something that was also mentioned um, at, the, at the beginning. Um, in relation to competition, you know, we have the entrance of big players like big tech, big tech companies entering in this this market, and because of the concerns that we have in digital markets in relation to um, anti-competitive uh, practices, notably uh, regarding the Apple Pay uh, case, um, this is why we also ended up behind the Digital Markets Act, which at the end of the day seeks to open up uh, markets to enable um, consumers to benefit from greatest choices, including on payment solutions that are supported by uh, NFC, uh, uh, the NFC and access to NFC antenna. So I think that this is something also we need to take into account, looking at the, uh, the big, bigger picture and seeing what are the possibilities also from other legislations. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Augustine. We'd hope to have uh, an engagement with the audience, but I, I think we have a, a look at Eileen's face. We have unfortunately no time for that, but uh, the panelists will be here throughout the day. So uh, you will have the, the chance to ask the many uh, remaining questions you have. Uh, I think we have to definitely stop here, but I would like to uh, ask you to uh, give my panelists a round of applause. I hope you've enjoyed the session.